Okay, good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Tim O'Malley. I'm CEO of Atima Media and Marketing. Thank you for joining us. We've received an outpouring of questions about marketing during these crazy and unprecedented times. That said, we felt like it was important for us to bring together the community to collaborate with this outstanding panel in order to share knowledge, ideas, and solutions, and you know, hopefully figure this out as it relates to each of our businesses. So our agenda today is simple. Again, um, we're going to jump in and um, look at these topics. We appreciate you being here. Uh, the panel discussion with uh, our panelists from Northwestern. We're so excited to hear from this great panel. And then we'll do Q&A at the end. So um, before we jump in, I'd like to thank my teammates at Atima for pulling this event together. Uh, I can tell you we too are a smaller team as a result of coronavirus and, I, and we've been working very hard to pull this together. So thank you to my teammates at Atima. Thanks to our partners in producing this event, Northwestern Medill Integrated Marketing Communications, Ansa Marketing, and our own Hospitality and Tourism Summit Chicago, Digital Visitor Network, Planner Masterclass, and Concierge Preferred Magazine. As long as we're talking about marketing, I guess we needed to talk about our brands as well. So it goes without saying. Um, so one of our main brand tenets at Atima is connecting people in order to help them and their businesses. In the past, that's meant a lot of things. It's meant physically bringing people together and facilitating introductions at our networking events or at our hospitality and tourism summit or even our planner master classes. It's meant connecting our partners with key audiences in order to allow them to sell and build the, their businesses. It's meant making phone calls or emails introductions on behalf of our partners to help them get things done it's meant sending information to any of our influencer groups, be it visitors or concierge, meeting and event planners, hotel salespeople, social media and influencers, et cetera. It's meant panel discussions to connect our partners with experts for advice and learning. Interestingly, that's all changed uh, recently. So in the last month, it's meant something completely different. We've, um, we're on a different path in terms of the circumstances, and I should say driven by the circumstances, and we've brought together over 2,000 people through eight digital events, ranging from educa educational panel discussions like today to a virtual pub crawl. So we've completely changed the way we've been doing things over the last month and uh, have been having a lot of fun doing it and, and bringing people together. I mean, we've always believed in the value of our community and are doing everything we can right now to keep us together. So uh, we believe we're stronger together, we're smarter together, We'll come out of this together and our city and our businesses will grow as, together as a result. So we've been, been producing this series of digital events um, to try and keep us together. And our next one, in fact, is tomorrow. So a little bit about us. We help tourism and group-oriented businesses grow by connecting them with a number of different audiences ranging from visitors and concierge to meeting and event planners and social media influencers. Here are our largest brands. Planner Masterclass is the newest and fastest growing with recent expansion into San Francisco. And we'll be sharing details about our digital visitor network in the coming weeks to help our partners target staycationers and visitors from the drive market, as well as geo-targeting downtown neighborhoods um, to get the locals. Here is uh, what we have for upcoming events. Next week is an industry virtual happy hour, uh, May 7th at 4 p.m. We're working on a safety and operations for tourism and group oriented businesses uh, panel. Um, we'll have uh, details on that very soon. Our planner masterclass right now is still scheduled for June 10th. That is a physical version and we're trying to figure out exactly um, if we need to change that up and we'll know in the next week. So details will come on that. And uh, the hospitality and tourism summit Chicago right now is postponed. I will say that um, we're sort of reinventing that uh, event for this year. We're looking to um, find the right time to use that as a sort of coming out party for Chicago in terms of letting the world know that uh, we're open for meeting and events and you know, come visit us, et cetera. So more details to come uh, on that. So uh, enough about us, let's get started. So in a minute, I'm going to introduce Kelly Cutler. She's the program director at Northwestern University's Medill School of Integrated Marketing Communications. Kelly will give us some insight into their program. She's gonna introduce us uh, to her other great panelists, and they'll each give us a two to three minute update on each of their areas of study 
in relation to marketing in COVID-19. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Kelly Cutler. Kelly teaches digital strategy by focusing on both the art and the science of marketing in the digital age. With more than 20 years of experience in digital marketing and digital media, Kelly has delivered solutions to the top brands and agencies in various industries. In addition to her work at Medill, Kelly consults with companies to provide insights and strategies in the realm of digital marketing. She also en enjoys delivering keynotes and workshops, I guess as uh, we'll see today, and uh, she does that across the country. When Kelly is not optimizing websites, she enjoys spending time with her husband, two daughters, and Rudy, the Dotson. Kelly, welcome, and thank you so much. Well, thank you, Tim. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you for bringing together this wonderful group of panelists and participants. Welcome everyone, good morning. It's uh, really nice to be here today talking about a subject matter that is incredibly important to all of us, which is the sort of situation that we're in right now with COVID-19 and how that impacts us as marketers and in our professional careers and for us with our students and with all of our different stakeholders at Medill. So before I jump into talking more about marketing and, and digital marketing, I'd like to introduce you to the Integrated Marketing Communications Graduate Program at Northwestern University. So as Tim mentioned, I am the program director for that particular program. Um, we call it the IMC Master's Program. And what's nice about this um, particular grad program is that we do offer a lot of flexibility. It is really designed for working professionals um, and we can uh, really deliver our coursework and our experiences in many different formats to really make it work well for the working professional. So we have entirely uh, online courses, which right now is um, incredibly effective. Uh, the fact that we have that um, and had that in place prior to this uncertain time is, has been very effective for us. Um, but we also have evening courses at our Chicago downtown uh, campus overlooking Navy Pier. And then we have flexible formatting, which com uh, actually combines the in-person and the online experience. So the, um, I think a uh, really special thing about IMC is of course it's customer centric marketing which we're going to be talking about today um, but also as Tim mentioned it's really the coming together of the art and science of marketing so what does that mean well it means that we are continuously updating our format and our program to incorporate the most cutting-edge um, marketing programs and courses so we offer things like consumer insight content strategy uh, brand awareness, um, sort of fundamental uh, marketing courses, as well as getting into kind of the, the science piece, which is digital analytics, digital leadership, digital strategy. And we really put all of that together to deliver whole brain marketing solutions for professionals who are looking to expand and, and really grow in their careers. Um, we offer also a lot of um, interesting options for our students that take them out of the Chicagoland area. Um, so we have domestic and international courses that take place in interesting locations like Asia, London, San Francisco. Um, we also offer week-long courses in Evanston and Chicago. Um, and we also really like for our students to be able to tap into our alumni. Of course, at Northwestern, the alumni network is a, a huge opportunity for networking and opportunities to connect with people at top companies, and corporations. And so we take that very seriously at Northwestern Medill as well. So I just wanted to provide you with that sort of um, brief overview of our program. If you are interested in finding out more about the IMC grad program, please visit our website or feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, on LinkedIn or via email or in whatever uh, channel or platform makes the most sense. I will not be on TikTok. That's the only one you can't reach out to me on. Uh, my daughters have forbade me from showing my face on TikTok. Okay, so that's enough talking about the Medill IMC program. Now let's switch gears and um, talk a little bit about what we're all sort of here for today. So I'm going to kick things off um, and talk about my uh, sort of topic, which is digital marketing. And then I'm going to introduce my 
esteemed colleagues and, and kind of turn it over to them. So um, as Tim mentioned, I'm Kelly Cutler and I work at Medill. Um, I teach a course called Digital Strategy. And that course really comes out of my professional career, uh, having run several digital marketing agencies where we focus on uh, technology and digital solutions for our clients. And my background really started out um, in digital marketing. I'm what many of my Medill faculty refer to as a digital native, um, which is a bit of an anomaly at Medill, actually. Um, we have a lot of folks with extensive experience in, in digital and analytics and advertising. Um, but my background really is specifically focused on digital marketing. And I started out um, early on at a company called Classified Ventures here in Chicago, which maybe many of you have heard of at some point or other. But um, one of the brands there is Cars.com, which most people have heard of. Um, and really, you know, back then we were doing uh, internet advertising and, and putting photos and, and videos online at a time where you know many people didn't even have computers on their desks. So it's certainly come a long way and that leads us kind of to, to where we are now, which unfortunately is this very uncertain kind of unprecedented time. And I think for marketers, it's very scary to be in this moment in history where it, it truly is unprecedented. We don't have anything to draw on. You know, some of us remember some very uncertain times around 9-11 or, you know, different moments in history. But I do feel like this is, is different than anything we've experienced. And I think what I like to try to focus on from a digital marketing perspective is the ability as marketers to maintain control of the things we can control. And there are many, many, many things, unfortunately, that are out of our control at this point in time. Um, but typically as marketers, we do have control of our website, our mobile app, um, you know, any of our owned properties, as well as our earned properties. And I talk a lot about SEO in my classes, have a, a big background in search marketing. And I think that that's something that we do have some control over. Um, Google and Microsoft have both made available several tools to help with search marketing during this kind of uncertain time. So the ability to quickly and easily post announcements on search engine results pages, um, announcements around uh, changes in our business based on COVID-19, um, or you know updates to our hours or uh, changes in the way that we work with our customers. So I think there are some things we can do there. Um, another area that I think we do have control over is our content and kind of our message. So um, in, in my class yesterday, uh, we talked a lot about um, the subject of deep social listening. And it really inspired me to think a lot about how important it is right now for brands to listen and not just sort of be um, reactive and, and feel like, oh, it's, it, it's an uncertain time. Everyone's talking about coronavirus and COVID-19. I better push out a message really quickly and, and just say something. Um, I tend to believe it's better sometimes to kind of sit back for a moment, listen, see what's happening, understand how competitors are communicating, understand what type of content is resonating with our audience and then really kind of move forward in a purposeful direction by understanding who we are as a company, who we are as a brand, and how we want our message to be received by our customers. And I can say from the perspective of Medill, as someone who really represents Medill, um, and as a, a marketer, I think about this every day. How do we represent Medill to our students and our faculty? How does Medill enter this conversation? What type of events or conversations do we want to put out to our students and to our faculty and our stakeholders to help reassure them that we're here for them during this difficult time? Um, and that's a message that I think is, is hopefully coming through for our students that we understand that they're in a difficult situation, an unprecedented time right now, and that we really want to answer that. And so we are putting together events much like Atima is doing for all of you, which I think is so incredibly helpful and shows such leadership um, to be able to, you know, really come together as a community, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how confused we are, um, to come together and to be able to, um, you know, share ideas, 
uh, ask questions, continue to build that knowledge base. So from a digital marketing perspective, I think it's really important to be thinking about the timing, the tone, the message, also the channel, right? The platform. Again, what do we have control over? Um, I've read that a lot of companies are slashing their digital marketing budgets. In my mind, I do look at that as a bit of an opportunity. So ad costs are very, very low right now on Facebook, on Google, on several different digital channels. So perhaps there can become um, some opportunities that open up um, in, in those difficult times. So that's kind of my perspective. Um, I hope that's helpful and I definitely look forward to the Q&A section. But first I'd like to turn it over to um, my esteemed colleagues who are joining me today. So I'm lucky enough to have two of the other faculty members from the Medill IMC program here today. And um, I would like to introduce Roy Wallen. Roy is a, a good friend of mine and a colleague. Uh, Roy is the president of Hansa Marketing, which is a, a marketing consulting services firm that provides email marketing and database marketing and all kinds of interesting things on the sort of data side of the art and science of marketing. Um, and Roy teaches digital analytics in the IMC program. So I'm very happy that he's here today with us. And then I'd also like to welcome and introduce uh, another good friend of mine, Hud Engelhart. And um, Hud is also faculty at the uh, Medill IMC program. And he is the managing partner of Beacon Advisors as well. I think that would be considered his day job um, while he's not teaching um, crisis communication at Medill, which he teaches both online and in class. Actually, both Roy, Hud, and actually myself all teach in both the online format and the in-class format. So welcome Roy and Hud. I'd like to actually turn it over now to you, Hud, to speak a little bit about crisis communications. Thank you, Kelly, very much. And thank you, Atima, for having us today. It's a great opportunity for us. And uh, I hope we're able to shed a little light on what's going on in this very chaotic and strange time in the world. You know, one of the things we do in crisis is look at how bad things are. And I must say, as we prepared for our get together today and looking at what's going on in the travel, tourism, events, and hospitality industries, uh, the carnage is significant. Um, I think the World Tra uh, Travel and uh, Tourism Council reported this month that the travel economy is off by 90% from this time last year. 50 million people have lost their jobs around the world. Um, five to eight million in the U.S. alone, and that the recovery time here is not going to be quite as easy as it was to shut off all this commerce. It could take us 12 to 14 months to get forward. Um, I, I must say, though, that there are some um, lights at the end of the tunnel, because the other thing we look at when we're in crisis is what's sort of going on in a broader context. And um, interestingly enough, the Consumer Confidence Index as reported by the conference board is not as low at the moment as it was at the height of the um, um, mortgage crisis of the, the Great Recession, if you will, in 2008, 2009. In fact, it's significantly better than it was then. I think in part that's due to the fact that the economy was in fact in very good shape when all this uh, pandemic issue began to arise. Investment markets are no worse than they were in 2008 and 2009. And if you've been watching the markets at all, you've probably noticed that things are beginning to rebound just a touch. I think some of the investment advisors are beginning to spy opportunities with the values that are in place with the market. I bring that up because when we look at individual companies in crisis, one of the barometers of how we're doing uh, often is the stock market. If you look at Boeing, for example, you can see a really uh, major league up and down chart showing how they performed during the course of the 737 MAX crisis. And then lastly, I think for your purposes and for ours as we look at marketing, you have to look at sort of what's going on in the broader marketing world. And uh, Marketing Week recently published some information on a survey they did, they did of brand marketers and 90% of them as of April are thinking about delaying their budget commitments for 20, the rest of 2020 and for 2021. So there, there's some significant issues to overcome as you look um, at, at what I would consider to be the new normal. And uh, that normal is going to really be uh, an interesting thing to witness for all of us and an interesting thing for us to communicate into. Um, we're gonna see a lot of remote life, I believe, 
business, education, medicine, entertainment, you, you go the whole way down the list of industries and you're going to see a different way of doing things. Um, my nephew is with um, CBRE down in Atlanta and they just finished a facility for Volkswagen um, where they at one time were 100,000 square feet and they've learned through their own auspices that remote has become a way of doing business. And they've now cut their space requirements down to 50,000 square feet and they have a key card entry system to an open space with PCs. And when you swipe your key card, it assigns you one of these spots for the day you're in the office, transfers your files to the PC that's at the desk. And when you close out, everything goes back up in the cloud and you leave and you come back to the office the next time to another station, if you will. So a lot of these things are going on even as we speak. I think in the hospitality industry, there's and some publicity about robot hotels. Um, and um, that may very well be a marketing opportunity as you move forward and starting applying the technology. Photo IDs may become a, a, a secondary identification uh, issue uh, next to health certificates, given what we've gone through with the pandemic. The other thing that I think that's been interesting is um, how companies and governments are making their decisions. And that's really where we focus uh, our class at Northwestern, because whatever you communicate can only be as good as the decisions that you're making. And I have a, um, uh, a protocol called Six Sigma, and it revolves around six decision filters. And I'd like to just touch on three of those filters um, uh, for the next moment or so. One has to do with transparency. Um, I, I think that if you look over the array of who's really communicating well and who's not communicating so well during the pandemic, you'll find some shining examples of how being completely transparent about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what sources you're using to um, um, guide your decision making and how long and to what end you're doing what you're doing is, is really important. Um, some of the best cases I've seen um, are one in your own industry where Arne Sorensen announced the dramatic changes in, the, in Marriott's business. If you want an object lesson in how to communicate empathetically and, with, and as an adult to another group of adults, watch his video, which is available on YouTube, and you will um, see a really empathetic and uh, powerful piece of communication that explains why Marriott was doing what it was doing. Likewise, if you go back to March 22nd and look what J.B. Pritzker did here in Illinois uh, in announcing the first stay at home order, uh, you will find seven minutes of really extraordinary communication with the citizens of Illinois about what needed to be done and why. Um, I, I would shut it off after the governor is finished because he's followed by an epidemiologist who um, I think kind of destroyed the mood of what he was doing. He was being cautiously er um, and optimistic, but urgent in his appeal. And I think the urgency turned into a lot of freneticism by a, um, an epidemiologist who rightfully is concerned, but maybe overstated the case of it. Some of the, some of the cases I, you might want to look at for what not to do, um, a carnival and its decision-making around uh, its cruise lines um, seems to um, be a, an epidemic of sorts of decision-making at that organization. United Airlines has had some difficulties. They've um, rightfully asked for relief from the federal government and the day they received it, they announced uh, monstrous layoffs. Again, not, not uh, a bad thing to do necessarily because the business isn't there, but the timing can um, have an impact on the way you think about the way you, um, uh, customers and others think about you. Quick service restaurants like um, Wendy's and Burger King and McDonald's have gotten huge sums of money. Um, meanwhile, uh, other small businesses are having trouble getting their payroll protection plans uh, funded because of the onset of, um, of the number of applications. And then you have organizations like Harvard and the Lakers um, who you would think would not need to get millions of dollars from the federal government and all of this, Harvard in particular, which has the, the most monstrous endowment ever. Uh, they've recently given back the money, but it's kind of interesting to see what the uh, impact on their reputation has been as, based on their, um, their ask. The, the second part has to do with opportunity. I tell my students that um, crisis, in point of fact, may be the most important marketing opportunity your company will ever have. And I say that because companies generally spend millions of dollars to connect with their customers based on some sort of value set. 
And in crisis, that value set gets tested in moments. And if you live up to your values, you will have a tremendous marketing opportunity going forward because you've proved to your customers that you're living up to what you've always had to say about them. Uh, so um, in this environment, then um, what you do about positioning your organization as you come out of the pandemic or post COVID-19 uh, with respect to what's going on in the minds of your customers uh, will be extraordinarily important. Your brand doesn't live in your headquarters. Your brand lives in the minds of your consumers. So in true IMC way at Medill, you need to be thinking like a customer and bring that customer's point of view into your company and into your decision-making process. And then last, um, I think we've all had a, a pretty good dose of accusations about fake news, wrong news, um, fearful news. Um, and I think in part that comes from the fact that we're all struggling to find out exactly what this virus is all about and there isn't as much science to communicate as we'd like to have. <clears throat> but importantly for the future, uh, I think we're getting an object lesson in what it means to have someone inside your organization who can act as what I refer to as the chief skeptics officer. A person or persons who can challenge management's decisions and do so without uh, repercussion as a way of representing the public's point of view in your decision making process. It becomes a test marketing of some sort, but uh, I always say that during a crisis, um, a, a good management team will have someone on the staff that's like the New York Times reporter for the internal audience. And they're asking the questions that the New York Times and other investigative organizations are gonna be asking to make certain that you've got the answers and that you've thought through what the implications may be and what the questions may be. I think that's extraordinarily important as you move forward and have to describe what your businesses are gonna be doing that's completely different from the way you used to do it. And before you impose um, uh, certain regulations, if you will, on them for the way they interact with you. So uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Roy Wollen, and uh, thank you very much for giving me a moment of your time today. Roy? Thank you, Hud. Those are great words to, um, to embrace. I'm so glad that you um, did that, because I feel like, you know, what, what value can I add to the conversation today? I feel like this is our moment, you know, and um, Hud, you called this an opportunity. And you remind me to remind everybody on, in this discussion <clears throat> that there's a difference between marketing and marketing communications. So let me introduce myself first and then I'll come around to what I mean by that. Um, I teach digital analytics uh, and B2B marketing at uh, Northwestern's Medill program. And so it's integrated marketing communications in our title, but it's not just get more promotional emails out, okay? So where I'm going with that is marketing is about strategy. Marketing is about understanding customers and marketing is about brand. And so if we see ourselves as marketing communications people, then we put ourselves in a small box. What should we be talking about? And the more talking, sometimes during a crisis, we don't need more talking. We need, we need strategy, authenticity. And if we think of ourselves, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, if we elevate ourselves to marketing in the true sense of the word about brand, about strategy, uh, and to amplify what HUD was talking about, where the brand lives in the mind of the customers, this is our moment because emotions are high and brand love is an emotional relationship. This is our moment when, if we're being tested as an industry and as a brand, we can come out with more authentic communications, not just communications about how we care, platitudes, but also plans, <clears throat> plans to consume the service, plans to communicate. And so what I mean by that is, um, how do we as marketers embrace our role uh, uh, as strategists, not just communicators, okay? So in Apollo 13, when you watch that movie and you think about that crisis, the flight director says, what do we got on this spaceship that's good? You know, do you, ever, do you remember that moment in the story? And so, my humble contribution to today's conversation is about science. I'm a big science fan. And when we talk about science, what's the relationship between science and marketing? I thought marketing was all pretty pictures and clever taglines. It's quite the reverse. And at Medill, we teach marketing science first and foremost. Yes, you wanna to communicate to break through the clutter, but if that's all you care about, if all you care about is clever 
slogans and marketing communications, this moment is going to be a failure. What I want to have you all think about is what can we do to be more data driven? And what that means in a time of a crisis is how do we listen to our uh, customers and our supply chain? What are the social listening technologies that we're putting to use? Is this the time where we should really do the research and the segmentation and demand that our digital marketing is more customer centric? Not just about the marketing technology, not just about the tools, but since this is our moment to listen well, to try out um, messages, uh, to be authentic in terms of communicating, but also you know, draw upon marketing science to figure out how the data will help us. And that could be be more empathetic. That could be configure the service differently. Uh, for example, United Airlines will talk about waiving fees for making changes uh, and other travel uh, uh, brands. This would be the time when they want to change some of the terms of their service so that they're trying to be helpful during the crisis. So that's a long-winded way of saying the way we teach marketing at Northwesterns is not be better communicators. I think that that's a small way of looking at it. It's be better marketing strategists. And what I mean by that is be more scientific, read the data, um, be more customer centric. And if we talk about search and social uh, as a tool for communicating, it's not just a matter of communicating more and being more clever or putting more promotions and deals to move the needle. That's not gonna work at this moment because people aren't traveling. And so it's not a matter of incentives. It's a matter of listening, configuring the service, um, earning the brand love, uh, reinforcing the brand position. And then when I don't have a crystal ball, I can't tell you what's gonna happen or when it's gonna happen. But when this moment passes, your brands and your um, clients' brands will be in a better position to reemerge based on the trust that you're building right now. I sound like I'm a pontificator. I sound like I'm a motivational speaker all of a sudden. Quite the reverse. Let me take a step back with you. I'll tell you what makes my agency tick and what I bring to Medill. It's all about data and it's all about reading the data and being marketing scientists. So this is your moment uh, as a leader of the firm, as a leader of the brand, to calm everybody down internally. I'm not saying you can head off um, uh, uh, you know, uh, reductions in force, for example. But what I am saying is you can um, assert your leadership and say, this is the time when we need to listen. This is the time when we need to read uh, the data. And this is the time when we need to try out different approaches, not just promotional messages, which will fail us in this time. And so we know that we put this, these data to work. It's digital, it's listening, it's analytics. And that applies to hospitality, tourism, cruises, uh, travel in general. We can all benefit from marketing science and rigor. And I think it's up to us as marketers and leaders to bring that to the, to the conversations because everybody is nervous at this point. I'm saying something that you don't need me to say because we're all feeling it right now. So what can we do as marketing leaders uh, to bring that sense of calm, to bring that sense of science? What should we be doing nowadays um, you know, while we wait for the crisis to, uh, uh, to subside? Um, if, in case I implied that we don't want to communicate, it's quite the reverse. Now is the time to over-communicate and to be authentic in the words and the messages. And that could be from leaders like the CEO of the firm. And I've seen a lot of those kinds of messages um, you know, recently. It could be on uh, refocusing messages and efforts on education, not promotion, as I mentioned. It could be trying new tools that you always knew that you had to get to, but um, you didn't have the time. Well, now's the time. So for example, be specific. Incorporating chat into a website strategy. If you have not done that, now is the time to over-communicate and that comes in multi-channel ways. So that could be automation, that could be uh, 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 contact centers and so on. It could be scripting. It could be a time to do research, to figure out what to say and who we're talking to. In the B2B side, it could be a, sense to, uh, a, a moment to refresh a sales pipeline, to reconnect with everyone on the, um, the value chain. In B2C, as I mentioned, it's a time to show leadership. 
that could be a marketing tune-up. You know, I remember back when I was a kid, clean your room, okay? So what does that mean? I'm not trying to be flip about it. That could be the moment to revisit segmentation, to revisit the customer data platforms that stores all your information, to make sure that you've consolidated all of your guests and travelers and customers into one uh, record. And what I mean by that is identity resolution, which is jargon for, do you know who you're talking to? And do you know the relationships that they have within a household and within their, um, their circle of influence? As I mentioned, it's a chance to over communicate, but not to necessarily sell. So this is your chance to recommit to privacy messages and to build a privacy, to centralize a privacy um, uh, um, part of your own media. And that could be a website. This is a time, as we mentioned with a team that's so good at this, to do virtual events to set up marketing technology and ways, different ways to consume a service that you provide while you're waiting. And first and foremost, and I heard Kelly Cutler say this, this is the time to be marketers that are listeners, not just big megaphone shouting, but listening to what your people and your customers and people in your pipeline uh, want to, uh, to talk about, questions that they might have, to encapsulate those questions as you segment your database, and then come out proactively with messages for how to weather the storm, how to consume the service, what the policies are. The, the main thing is, and I've learned this for, from some of our clients, I run an email marketing agency. You know, we, we work with other brands like a banking brand, talking about comfort of home. So that's Synovus, big banking um, group uh, in the United States, uh, emphasizing different channels to touch the brand. And that could be mobile or that could be virtual. And, and, and the fam, quite proud of one of our other clients, which is Keurig, the coffee maker, and they have a campaign fueling the front line. So this is where they give free coffee makers and free coffee pods to medical institutions and, and um, hospitals and so on. So it's also a moment if you invest uh, to create goodwill. And so it's not always crisis, it's also a reaction to the crisis as, as HUD was teaching us about. And that public relations and that, um, that kind of effort, Keurig doesn't do this to get press. Keurig does it because it's the right thing to do. I'm so proud of brands that are stepping up and going the extra mile to create goodwill and to create um, a way of giving back to the industry. So that's a long-winded way of introducing myself and the analytics class that I teach. I don't want to pretend to know what HUD knows because crisis communications and decision-making is his focus and has been for many, many years. I will, not to be a modest, I will say that this is when you wanna use science and marketing science will script your marketing communications. Data science and digital analytics will help you with social listening and test and learn processes, help you determine what to say and to try things and to listen uh, as you communicate and not just be blasting out communications to buy more, this is your time to educate and to connect and to build the brand. And now more than ever, brand is what matters. So I hope the one thing I want you to take away from my short introduction here is there's a big difference between marketing and marketing communications. Think of yourselves uh, in, in this industry and in this crisis as marketing people in the pure sense of the word, listening to customers, formulating strategy and communicate, not always selling, not always promotions, not always deals. Um, marketing communications is a part of what you do, but marketing strategy is what this time um, requires. So with thank that said, that's a long-winded way of saying, I, I wanna just thank Atima again, and I'm happy to be part of this discussion. So Tim, maybe before you get started, I could uh, answer just a couple of things that Roy and, and Kelly both said. One, one of the other decision pillars we look at is uh, defined by protection, you know, who are you going to protect whenever the crisis occurs? And on almost every instance, that boils down to protecting your customer. Um, and uh, I think in this case, um, during the uh, pandemic, it is pretty easy to see who to protect. Uh, but it's not always easy to communicate the decisions you make as a consequence. And I think one of the big decisions that's going to have to be made, and is being made by governors and um, uh, federal authorities is when the um, the effects of the economic downturn become more severe than the effect of the pandemic itself. 
and someone needs to sort of balance when all that happens and when the science and the politics and the socialization all need to come together as a consequence. And the other piece of that protection has to do with bringing together all your resources to make sure you're protecting the customer. And one of those resources that we often overlook is our own workforce. So as you all are thinking about how you're going to re-enter the workplace and re-enter the marketplace, your best allies and your best ambassadors are the people that work for you, and they are going to have to deal with an utterly new reality. So don't forget that they need to be communicated with effectively as well. Uh, and then last, I'll only say that um, um, Roy's distinction between marketing and communications is really a, value, a valid one. Uh, I say to my students that it, it is in crisis, communicators and marketers who tend to be staff people really have an opportunity to do an, an extraordinary thing. And that is to tell an operating manager what he or she is supposed to do, not what they're just supposed to say. Uh, in point of fact, if the do isn't right, if you aren't doing the right things, you can say anything you want and the public is not going to be fooled. So you need to make sure those are completely aligned as you move forward. That's the end of my spiel there, thanks. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, wanted to jump right in with some questions. So um, it, it seems that just so much there that we can dive into. Um, I feel like I should just turn this off and listen for the next rest of this, but we have a lot of questions from our attendees. But one of the base things here um, is it seems to me that businesses are gonna need to market quite simply to let people know that they're open and alive and what are their new realities? How, why, why should uh, people feel safe there? And what their new offerings might be, you know, because that's gonna change quite a bit. So how do they balance that? You know, if we get a message for our audience, how do they balance those needs to communicate with budget? You know, I mean, budget is tough right now and everybody's trying to balance those two things. Do you have some perspective on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's an important thing to be thinking about. And I, again, I, I, I look at digital channels, particularly earned and owned, um, as being, you know, low cost, um, not necessarily free, but, you know, lower cost, sort of easier to execute opportunities. Um, and then also, you know, like I said, with social media, I think, you know, Facebook in particular right now is in a very interesting space, um, which is that it's at an all time high um, for usage and um, you know people are spending more time than ever before more people more time than ever before on Facebook and ad prices are at an all time low. So I do think you know there are those opportunities to look for and I, I always say you know fish where the fish are so you know go where the people are who are your customers who are going to be looking for your um, you know reopening your new hours your new way of doing business you know this important information. If we don't give our customers that information, um, you know, they can't do business with us. They, they, they're lost. They don't, they don't know where to go. So, you know, think about, again, customer-centric marketing. Where are they and how do I reach them and how do I quickly and easily provide them with a message that, that helps them do business with me? I think one thing that's important to remember is most Americans feel awful that this is happening and they, they want to give business to the companies and the brands and the businesses that they are loyal to and that they, um, you know, are used to doing business with. So, you know, we need to just keep that in mind and then figure it out. So, you know, another uh, owned opportunity I think is email, right? First party data. What, what list do you own and how can you utilize that to effectively communicate important information and not, you know, pie in the sky, we're all in this together. Yes, that's important. And the tone is very important, but the specific message that you're trying to deliver, what your new hours will be, when you think you'll be able to open, what that looks like, whatever the case might be, but really, you know, providing that information in a way that is what your customers want you to do so that they can receive the information. Any other thoughts on that, gentlemen? I would just um, say one thing here, and that is, um, I, as I've looked at the impact on the events business in particular, um, it seems like local and regional events are going to probably come back with um, a little bit more certainty and a little bit more power than the large events due to the socialization issues. 
and um, it, we're doing a, um, a lot of work with the California News Publishers Association and um, their 500 newspaper members. And um, it, just as Kelly just referenced, the demand for local news has never ever been higher. The readership in uh, community and ethnic newspapers is going through the roof at the same time that advertising dollars are plummeting by as much as 70 or 80 percent. So these smaller outlets and these smaller channels are really in peril of not being in existence. Uh, I'm not saying that because you ought to train your uh, budgets toward that particular channel, but I think the reality is as we pull out of the pandemic, a number of the channels that we've been kind of uh, come accustomed to using in regional and local levels might not be as available as they once were. So um, I, I think there's a whole number of considerations there. And I think Kelly also hit the nail on the head. There's a, it's sort of like the stock market. There's a lot of value to be had in the media marketplace at the moment. And maybe that's something that you all could be looking at to be more efficient or to reduce your costs. You know, one of the questions I, I, um, I want to maybe not be the, um, the magician that answers this question about the future, but spark the conversation to amplify what I just read. <clears throat> One of the questions was, how do we allocate and plan our marketing budget and our advertising budget now? So HUD, I'm, I'm gonna ask you, do you feel from your experience that this is a time when you take marketing budget off on the sideline and you wait? I agree with your optimism that when things come back, you know, that's gonna be a time to invest in media again. It may be different types of media, but there will be budget that will be required. <clears throat> from your experience, is this the moment when brands completely retreat from spend and they just wait for the go signal to spend it? Or is there something that they should be doing now with their marketing budget? It's a question I just read online and I was curious to know from your experience working with brands, what do you do with the budget while we wait? Well, um, just a couple of observations. First of all, you know, at Procter & Gamble, when these sorts of events take place, they double down on their marketing budget. They're, they're so confident in their product offerings that they believe that in these periods of downturn, they have an opportunity to build market share and build brand mind share, if you will. So they double down. Um, on the other hand, just a week or so ago, you probably may have noted that Coca-Cola has decided to pretty much shut off the marketing channel altogether. They're, they're not going to be doing nearly as much as they used to. So I think in part during this kind of a crisis, the, the question really is cultural and it has to do with the confidence that your management team has in the product line and in the marketing that goes along with it. In this kind of a crisis, I think it's fair to deploy marketing. Some others, you know, where you're having a sexual harassment problem or whether you've got a problem like Boeing had where it, um, its, it's consideration of safety and other items were under question. I think you have to be much more judicious about how you use your marketing budget and how you direct it and what messages you're delivering. Uh, but I, I think where you're headed, Roy, is where I am, and that is you just don't shut down because the crisis is here. I think you need to find a way to slug on because I, I firmly believe that this crisis is going to pass uh, just as most others I've seen in my 50 years in this business. And as a consequence, you're going to want to be positioned to take advantage of the upturn whenever it comes to, to the extent that you can. Not everybody's got a budget that they can uh, keep spending, but uh, right. to the extent you can market, I would say you ought to be doing it. It's interesting. I, I just wanted to uh, agree again, and I'm thinking about how budget can be more brand building at this point uh, rather than promotional. And what that means is it, it's not just communicating <clears throat> we care, but it's also educational and ways to consume the service or uh, it could be refund policies, but it also could be messages about, um, you know, supportive messages about what to do and to, to show leadership. And so what that means is don't stop spending, just change the way you're spending the marketing budget and change the messaging from promotional to more uh, brand building and more relationship building. That's what I see. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know whether that means the budget goes down uh, by a lot, by a little, but I do agree with you from my experience that you don't want to just put all the funds on the sideline and wait, because that's a follower strategy to me. Let me, let me ask you, so, so for a lot of our customers <clears throat> here, you know, attractions, restaurants, retailers, et cetera, yeah. um, are thinking about, you know, 
there's going to be less people on planes flying here. Um, we have a good drive market, a 300 mile radius around Chicago. We can focus on folks that, um, you know, might feel comfortable putting a family in a van and driving down for the weekend in Chicago or coming from Milwaukee or whatever, staycationers, that type of thing. Um, and the hope is, you know, just like 9-11, that was kind of what came back first. The hope is the same thing here. And HUD, you mentioned the local events coming back as well. So that's what our focus is. We're focused on the Atima bringing our clients' ability to do content marketing to those groups, to do um, digital marketing to those groups, to locals, staycationers, et cetera, um, through the some of the channels you mentioned, like Facebook, like you know, programmatic, um, email, et cetera. What are some of the other things and channels we should be thinking about and even messaging to get to those specific audiences? Because that's what a lot of the folks on this call are, are looking to target. Thoughts? Well, my, my first thought goes to the messaging, actually. Um, I think when it comes to the business that your clients are in, uh, not just the, the niche that you're in, or it's not just that you're in events or you're in travel, I think it has to be an experience type message because I think a lot of people, even though they uh, possess this pent up demand to get in their car and go somewhere else under these circumstances, I think that this is one of those instances where safety overcomes the price point and overcomes the appeal of the destination. So uh, I think to some degree, you're going to have to let customers know and let your clients know that you can come to Chicago and things are going to be different, but it's going to be safe. You're going to be, we're going to go through protocols that are going to keep you safe while you're here um, and things along those lines in order to give the level of comfort that I suspect is required for people to get and travel and go to places where they're likely to be uh, in, in, in what used to be crowded areas, but now have to be socially distant for a while. Any you know, my comments? humble contribution to this, if you don't mind, is Please. I, you know, I do not have an answer. Uh, all I have is process. And this has been what I've been spending my whole life doing, which is science. And the science process tells me <clears throat> to ideate, to try things, but not just push things out, to conjure up ideas like messages, to HUD's point about what to say, it's safe to travel is one message candidate, you know, and then try things in terms of message maps, message tests, test and learn, test, learn and scale. What I'm looking for there is asking my advocates and asking the personas of my business, the segments that matter, um, you know, for help. And what I mean by that is showing them different images and showing them different messages and then trying different emails with different subject lines and different messages and calls to action. And then reading the analytics to see what's resonating. And those early experiments will show you something that's um, working. And then you, as a process, scale up the winners. That's the only thing I can um, contribute to the discussion because <clears throat> I can't predict the future. <clears throat> but the science will help us figure out what to do. That's good. So um, while, you know, we're still in this sort of quarantine phase, obviously hoping to be out of it in 30 days or so, what can companies be doing to uh, fine tune their digital marketing assets? Um, so I just wanted to, maybe add on really quickly to what Roy just said. I think one other thing that would be interesting um, from a testing or sort of, you know, marketing perspective also is the nice thing about digital is that A, it's real time and B, it has a lot of controls that are available, um, you know, versus, uh, you know, mass media or PR HUD in your, in your world where once you put it out there, it's out. Yeah, um, with cool. digital, <laughs> yeah. With digital, you can do some really small um, segmented testing to Roy's point. So one thing that I would do if I were looking at, you know, opening up some ad opportunities in um, Wisconsin to, to try to bring people into Chicago when, when the time is right, when it for sure is safe and, and we have that message in place, um, I would do some geo-targeted campaigns on Facebook to a very specific segment. I would test uh, the imagery, to your point, Tim, um, 
you know, the, the creative assets are going to change for sure. Um, how many of us have been, you know, watching TV and you see an ad, you know, that's clearly three months old and it, it sort of angers you to see that, right? Because you can't go to the movies. You can't, you know, do these things that these companies are still advertising. It's not really the company's fault, but it's, it is frustrating when you're quarantined and you're locked down and you love nothing more than, you know, to be able to go to a movie or go do something that you, you can't do right now. So you do have to be sensitive to that. And I think it is a time to look at your creative assets and, and ensure that you have things in place that are appropriate and relevant for this time. And again, I, I'm a big believer in what Roy is talking about with testing. We, Roy and I talk about this all the time. The digital strategy is completely reliant on the digital analytics. The two work hand in hand. And without you know the, the one, you can't have the other. So you've got to test the imagery. I can't tell you today what images are going to be the most effective. I'm not really sure, right? Again, it's an unprecedented time. We don't know. But really, in, in reality, it's always like that. We never know, right? Mm -hmm. How many times have you run a test and you are positive that you right. know which creative will win and you're wrong, right? It happens to me all the time. We run a test and, and you know, I say, oh, it's for sure it's going to be A. B is never going to make it. You know, the call to action isn't strong enough. The color isn't right. You know, whatever it is. And, you know, we're wrong. And that's why we depend on science when it comes to digital marketing. So let's say uh, along those, I want to pick on you a little, Kelly. Let's say we're wrong half the time. And we admit that as veterans in marketing, that we're going to be wrong one out of two times. That's a big burden lifted off of our shoulders to be smart and to pick the winners of the horse race. You can't, you know. And so there's a wonderful question uh, on, the, uh, on the webinar today that I want to push back towards you. What does the panel think about using imagery that shows social distancing? And you had mentioned this a second ago about showing everything's going to be okay. We're all hugging and movies and we're all close. That is stale and it doesn't resonate. It feels old. And so the question is, and I don't want to tip your hand, but the question is, well, what's the opposite? Are we showing people having a fun experience in a destination with masks on, sitting six feet apart? Uh, to me, that is a chance to test it and then uh, see if that resonates and get feedback from uh, segments and personas that matter. What would you do with something like that, Kelly? You have so much experience with trying things like images and messages. Would you go out and build an image like that just because you're curious about whether or not that would resonate or send the right message? What do you do? Yeah, I would definitely test it. I agree, Roy, with, with the testing theory. And I think um, one thing about that is I do think people are sort of looking for, you know, sort of help understanding what the future looks like. We don't know, right? We're not sure. Every time I go and walk my dog, I see, you know, more people with masks, more people with, um, you know, wearing gloves, even when it's warm outside, you know, those types of things. Now in the state of Illinois, if you want to go in a public place, you have to wear a mask, right? So these things continue to evolve and change. Um, I was reading something the other day about when movie theaters open up, you know, how they're going to, um, you know, sort of coordinate that. I think visually seeing it is actually very helpful for people. I think it's hard for people to imagine some of the scenarios of the future. And so as marketers, if we can start to help people see how this can work, um, that's very helpful. I was reading something the other day about bookstores opening up in Germany. Um, Germany is doing a gradual reopen right now. And they're going to have bookstores open up, you know, two to three days a week, and they only allow so many people, and there has to be a certain amount of distance. And, you know, seeing photos of that really helped me visualize it. Similarly, I have a friend who's an entrepreneur who owns a company that does um, uh, photography, takes photographs, and put, turns them into really interesting, creative um, pieces. And one thing that he got, has gotten into is he's doing... Uh, putting photography and logos and things like that on decals and he's selling decals to retail outlets and, and places that need to be able to uh, visually represent where people can stand and what that looks like from a retail perspective in the future. So I think there's a lot of innovation happening. I think there are a lot of really smart people working on this. And so it becomes our responsibility as marketers to do the same, to test things and, and to try things out and to help our customers visualize what the future can look like. I couldn't agree more. If I could just say, innovation is what makes marketing tick. But um, I always warn my students, how would you know what's going to work until you test it? And so be innovative, be creative. And this is for everyone who's listening 
to the discussion today. Come up with great ideas. Even listen to the way customers are saying things and those customers can suggest ideas or lead to ideas, but never feel like you have the answer without testing. And that's what marketing science is about. And that's what Medill is about, which is you have a, a lot of good ideas and you will be constantly surprised at what will work. And you can make it a game, a contest. You can have different versions, however you want to do it. But the one thing that I'm saying is don't presume to know the answer and skip the testing and just be in a rush to get some messaging out because you will be unpleasantly surprised when something either doesn't work or there's something in there that you didn't intend at all. So Roy, right. right. is there a way they can be testing this now as they're trying to sort of, you know, um, clarify or, or clean up their digital assets and get ready yeah. for coming out in the next month? That's exactly right. I think that's a wonderful suggestion and you're reminding me of something that I should have said, which is we should be testing up a storm right now. Um, and what that means is different message maps. Um, and that's just jargon for different kinds of messaging umbrellas that um, words fall within. So themes, subject lines, imagery, um, tone, all of those um, ideas are up for grabs. And it's more science than just, you know, trying things like your pet project. Tim, to your point, now is the time that you could be doing that in a very tiny way to statistically significant, but very small samples so that you can figure things out before um, you want to roll something out. The opposite of that is I have a feeling in my gut and I'm just going to roll it out when everybody's ready and it's going to fall on its face. I guarantee it. So that's a great. Right. Could, could, could you clarify that for our audience? What do you mean by in a very small way? Meaning go live with such a sig small uh, test that it doesn't really impact the market, but you get the data you need. Is that what you're exactly. saying? That's exactly right. So the question is, uh, uh, you know, not to be uh, uh, academic about it. Statistically, what's the tiniest number of people we can ask a question to and get a reliable answer that's scalable? What's the smallest amount of numbers of people that we trust that we can try something with? to get an answer so that when the time is right, we can open up the floodgates and get that messaging out. It's gotta be tiny, so it's lots of different things we can try and kind of imperceptible, right? It's not a big campaign, it's an experiment, but then two or three ideas and themes will emerge. And we know that now so that when things begin to change, we already have the, the fastest horses on the track and we know it's gonna win. Why? Because we tested it. But and that means headlines, visuals, Sorry. all content, correct? Exactly. Headlines, visuals, tone, uh, imagery. Um, do you want one of the questions which sparked this great conversation is, do you want to show people with masks or not? I mean, how would I know? So try it two different ways and see which one would resonate. You could do primary research. You can have a panel. You can do attitudinal research. Or you can have a call to action to see which one really moves the needle. So if it's a question that we're all thinking about, try it. Try it in a very limited way and then get the answer before you have to bet on it big time and roll it out. I think it probably also goes without saying, Tim, that it, this just doesn't apply to images and messages. I think in this environment, we ought to be sort of leaning into what everybody knows and being creative about the way the experience looks. Um, you know, I, I read something the other day about drive-in movies becoming a, uh, a new thing because, you know, going to the theater isn't quite what it used to be. Uh, so I, I think as we re-enter or as the economy begins to reopen, I think businesses should be thinking about uh, not just the look of what they're doing, but also the very nature of it. Um, because we're, we're not going to get quickly back into a, let's all go off to the tavern on Friday night and, and, and um uh, have a drink because you're still going to need to be in kind of a different mode. But let's find a different way to do that so that everybody's comfortable sort of going past social distancing and getting into the space. So an interesting, I mean, one of the more cost efficient ways to market is through partnering. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the concepts yesterday, we did a state of the meetings and events industry topic with some folks from around the country. And one of the things that came up was, this concept that events like they might not, they're typically not going to be as big as they have been. And perhaps given the need for social distancing, there's this sort of a hub and a spoke concept where, you know, the hub might be McCormick place in our case, and there's a smaller 
group there than generally, but maybe the spoke elements are, you know, some of the restaurants that might be underutilized. Um, and perhaps there's communication between the two so that you can participate um, with everything that's going on. A lot of, lot of different thoughts there. Um, given that sort of uh, mindset and, and how this could affect the industry, looking at our specific industry, maybe three to five years from now, what do you see it will have changed? How do you see some of the, the uh, um, you know, the process uh, for you? I know Roy is big or the communications. Um, how do you guys see that this is going to change forever? That's a big question. Who wants to take that? <laughs> Um, I, I'll, I'll take a bit of the stab at it. I, um, in some industries, um, I, I think that as time rolls on and as we get our hands around what this coronavirus COVID-19 issue really is all about, I think a lot of things are going to go back to what we used to refer to as normal. I, I'm hopeful that as we become more comfortable being um, proximate to each other, that restaurants and other gathering places are going to find themselves 12, 14 months from now uh, back in a situation where they were before all this began, where we can actually sit down at a table of six and have a real life conversation and be what we believe to be socially human, if you will. Uh, in other instances, I think, um, and maybe this doesn't, it, this may apply more in the um, hotel industry, for example, um, I, I think where uh, there, there's a constant turnover in occupancy and you don't know who was in the room before you and uh, what they may have brought into the room or whatever the circumstances are, I think you're going to have to find a new way to comfort your customer that you wouldn't have to do in a restaurant environment, for example. So I think those things are going to be really permanent. I, I also think that Remote meetings, uh, as much as we probably are so tired of them today, I mean, I, I spend more time on a, on, in fact, I had a friend the other day say, you know, I wish we'd get rid of Zoom because everybody can call a meeting in 20 seconds and I can't make every meeting, right? Um, so I, I think we're gonna, I, I hope we don't overuse the digital technology that's available to us to meet like this. I think it's fabulous, um, but we need, there is a an essential need for human interaction that even you have to have in business. I, I love looking at Kelly and Roy's face on these webinars and, and you, Tim, and Dylan as well. But in point of fact, nothing really replaces the notion of us actually being in a room and being able to understand what the body language is like, what the tonality is all about, what's really behind our eyes. Um, and, and so I, I think you know, we're gonna see a hybrid of remoteness uh, before us. I think in Kelly, in our world, in the higher education world, I think there's huge changes that are going to be coming about over the next two or three years because, and maybe it's accelerated a pattern that's already begun. Um, in fact, you know, we're, Northwestern is deep into online learning. You've seen Purdue purchase Phoenix and become Purdue Global. So, I mean, I think a whole lot of what's going to happen with the people that your industry recruits is going to begin happening online. So I, I, I think you can look down the road and expect and look at your own environment and see just what you're doing now. And you can see where things that you always used to do are maybe not so as important as what you used to do, but others you're going to find a way to hang on to. And I, that's the only way I can wrap my head around all the process changes that are likely to occur because we had this. I, I mentioned before the newspaper industry in California uh, we had a, a columnist at Politico in Washington last week urge Congress from his platform not to give relief to the newspaper industry. And he likened the, the industry and, and relief to giving a ventilator to a corpse. So, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here dealing with an industry that um, admittedly is a bit of a dinosaur when it's come to adjusting to what Kelly and Roy do. Uh, but in some areas of the country, um, it's the only thing there is. I mean, so you've got news deserts existing in some places in the country. Um, and oddly enough, if you look at what happens in those communities where the newspaper isn't the watchdog for local government, for example, taxes are higher, um, other services aren't as good as they could be, transparency isn't where it ought to be. 
Um, so, you know, I mean, in some ways, in this industry, at least in the newspaper business, I mean, you're looking at putting some parts of democracy in peril. So it, it, it really, I think, is almost industry specific. Okay. Brilliant. Well, thank you. So we're wrapping up here. We've got a few more minutes. So panelists, I, you've done a great job. I very much appreciate it. So I'm, I'm hoping we can give some short tips, um, quick insights, takeaways for our audience here that um, you know, if you're if you're in an elevator and you got uh, two minutes, to tell them exactly what they should be focused on. In in uh, in short, uh, what would those things be? That's a great way to kind of wrap this up. Who'd like to start? I'll jump in if you don't mind. Uh, I'm going to reiterate what I said, which is now's the time to over communicate. And we talked about retreating on budgets, and I feel from today's discussion, the consensus is reallocate the budget. Maybe it's retreat on some paid media and retreat on promotional messages. But my advice to my clients is to over communicate, to be authentic, to configure the service, um, to meet the times, to look ahead, to try things now, to get your segments in order, to build a privacy um, uh, module, to build you know a chat feature into website, for example, to do things that you've always wanted to do, but didn't have the time, now's the, now's the moment, but to focus the efforts on education, not promotion, and to be authentic in the messaging because marketing is more than marketing communication. We have to talk about what the brand means to people and reinforce that brand, but also not just pontificate, listen, and to build in social listening and to put the, the, um, the advocates, the brand advocates, and um, your best customers to work, and they will help you figure out what to say and the images to use and try lots of things. Now is when we should be busy as a community of marketers, not waiting. That's my advice to everybody for what it's worth. Roy, thank you so much. Who would like to go next? Uh, I'll jump in, I guess. Um, I, I think there are two things. Um, I don't know who said this, but I'm going to, and I'll use a paraphrase of it, but you know, you don't, you don't really learn so much through success. You learn mostly by your, negative experiences, if you will, and by virtue of prevailing. So I would say that during this period of time, we need to have our learning tentacles up way high. And I say that because I think the other thing that one ought to be thinking about is planning for the next crisis, if you will. I mean, when we learn about how we're responding now and what we need to do in order to uh, find a way to resolve the crisis, uh, it's not just a learning experience. It's an opportunity to plan for the unplanned. So, and I, I would say that that's a, that's a um, critical aspect of what's going on today. The other is, and um, this is really the last of my six decision criteria, um, and it may seem like it's utterly obvious, but in this day and age, sometimes it's very difficult to come to grips with it. And that is, no matter what the issue is and how difficult it may be to communicate it, tell the truth. Stick to it and don't try to alter it. Don't try to spin it. Be adult about it and treat your audience like adults as well. But stick to the truth. It will set you free, as someone once famously said. Very good. Kelly? Um, so I agree with both Roy and HUD. And I'll just add a few sort of more tactical pieces here. Um, being in, you know, digital marketing and, again, you know, talking about sort of maintaining control over the things that we can control. So again, I think SEO is critically important right now. Um, I agree with Roy, it's a good time to do some housekeeping and, and you know, make sure that the ducks are in a row. And I'll talk that, the, you know, the same thing is true from an SEO perspective. So is your FAQ section up to speed? Do you have new, important, relevant, timely content added to your website? Are you thinking about your search engine optimization strategy? Are you posting regular updates and, and content information for your customers? And then also, you know, are you using tools to understand what's happening out there in the world around your industry, your brand, your competitors, your products and services, your marketplace, you know, if it's Chicago, um, what are people saying? So using deep social listening to really understand the conversation before just pushing out 
messaging. So using Google Trends, using Spy Food, using um, all of the different tools that are out there and available. Many, many of these tools are free. Mention.com is another for social listening. Um, just to understand the conversation um, so that the message and the tone and the timing that you, you craft is you know, relevant to what your customers are expecting. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This was so insightful. I learned a ton. I'm sure everyone else uh, did as well. Um, your uh, program is very impressive um, all the way around. So I very much appreciate you being here. Um, I'm excited, very excited. In, fa in fact, you, a few of you mentioned this as an opportunity. Uh, I'm excited to share our products, our digital offerings with uh, our clients in terms of reaching the staycationers and reaching folks from the drive market. And of course, all the visitors that do come to Chicago, though there's going to be less of them. Um, we're doing everything we can to try and uh, help our customers get a bigger piece of that pie. So this is going to really help that. So thank you.